So welcome everyone to Effective Giving Day 2021. This is our America's event. I am Grace Adams. I am the new head of marketing for Giving What We Can. And today I'll be hosting our Q&A. For our Q&A today, we have six lovely, lovely guests. We have got Michael Plant, who is the founder of the Happier Lives Institute, Joey Savoir, the director of strategy at Charity Entrepreneurship, Siobhan Brenton, the Manager of Operations for Rethink Charity, Johannes Akva, a researcher at Founders Pledge, Taylor Smith, the Philanthropy Advisor at GiveWell, and Luke Freeman, the Executive Director of Giving What We Can. So I have got several questions here in the Q&A function, and I thought we would start off from the highest voted question from Sophie. Sophie asks, how do you think about the trade-off between being faithful to the same charities from year to year slash following them closely versus giving to the changing top charities of, value, of charity evaluators over time? Happy to throw that one out to any of you. Luke, I can see you've got your mic on. So if you wanted to go first. It, it depends what you're optimizing for. Like, I think you can you can do a lot of good by continuing to follow the advice of evaluators. That's what they're trying to do is keep finding the mar kind of biggest marginal impact. But evaluators, as Taylor will speak to, are looking for a particular lens. Um, so GiveWell, for example, they're looking for recommendations they can put out into the world and know that people might start giving to indefinitely. So they can absorb a lot of money for a reasonable period of time. There are many other things like Joey will probably talk to is uh, if you get in early with a new charity that is uh, yet unproven um, and it turns out to be, you know, it needs that funding for a while to get that those runs on the board, that can be something worth supporting for a while. And there's a, another element that if a charity is no longer a top recommendation, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's no longer effective and maybe highly effective, but um, it also doesn't have the kind of marginal need for funding. And a lot of charities may rely on uh, ongoing support, which is also why they're not expecting that they do have that marginal impact. And especially in the space of meta charities, a lot of the time those aren't the types of things that are being put forward to individual donors uh, as a recommendation from an evaluator. So organizations like, you know, Giving What We Can and Rethink Charity and like organizations doing research or regranting and things like that, those themselves do also have operational costs uh, that are often funded by donors who are consistent over many years based off the organization's theory of change um, and that it's not actively seeking fundraising for itself to the general public. Maybe one thing I'll just add on to that is it probably really depends on the size of the donor as well. Uh, so if you're a fairly small percentage of a charity's budget, switching when something more effective comes up is, is pretty safe. If you were a large donor, say funding 50% or 25% of an organization's budget, uh, then you want to be a lot more careful with those sort of switches. Typically, what you'll see even very large grant makers is look of exit grants, look of some sort of notice or some sort of awareness that they will be scaling down their funding over time, as opposed to doing a full uh, switch, uh, even if something is determined to be more effective. So that also depends on your kind of thinking about the scale of your donation relative to the percentage budget of the charity that you're donating to. Yeah, I think I'd like to partially sort of echo what, what Joey says there. I mean, if you're imagining that you're a large donor and then you, sort of you disappearing without notice, could, could, that could be terminal to an organization. Um, so you, could, you, you want to be careful about the effects that will have. I guess I what I take the point of uh, effective outreach to be to, uh, to do the most good, to kind of make lives as happy as we can, um, rather than to have an obligation to particular charities. I take it that like, the end result is trying to be a benefit particular uh, in individual. So if it's cost between thinking, oh, you know, this charity will have a, a gap in their funding budget, but then you know, much more good can happen over here, then I think we ought to respond to the, the call of moral obligation, the opportunity to, uh, to do good. I think if you're thinking, well, do you know what? Like, I'm pretty sure that if I was starting now, I would do something else, then I would switch. That's probably a good sign that uh, you should be switching. Uh, and of course, you know, the, what, what the kind of effective average world is trying to do is we come up with good stuff and then we hashtag try to do good better. And to do good better is going to involved that we, we engage in this in this switching some caution uh involved but i think we should be we should be excited about uh, finding better so we have uh another question from an anonymous attendee uh around climate change so johannes maybe this one is best suited for you to answer first so on climate change 
After all of the attention given to COP26, do you think that there are still neglected areas where donors can have a significant impact? Okay, okay. let me slightly rephrase the question because I, I think it's not really COP26 that we should be thinking about if we're thinking about that question. So I think COP26 hasn't really changed my mind very much about climate philanthropy. Uh, I think overall, uh, over the last couple of years, we should probably become a little bit less worried about climate just because the outlook overall has improved. John Halstead and I have a post on this in the EA forum for anyone who's interested. But I think the the more fundamental thing that has really changed kind of the, the outlook on like what's neglected in uh, climate philanthropy is kind of how climate philanthropy itself has developed. So like how Jeff Bezos, since Earth Pledge in particular, has essentially doubled uh, climate philanthropy by foundations within the course of a year. And I've been asking myself this question, like, are there still neglected spaces now that it's becoming such a such a more crowded space? And we did a lot of analysis on this uh, this year. So like not only like uh, grants from last year, but also like including the one of the Bezos commitments from this year and kind of grouping them and trying to find where the neglected spaces are. We have a, a new report that's kind of uh, focused on this. And I think the thing to see there, like the short, uh, the TLDR is, okay, overall, if you're like a rainforest or a solar panel, you're probably pretty well taken care of. Like the, the funding for those areas has increased by a factor of four or so over the last year. Um, but there's still like very neglected spaces within that's like anything around like industrial decarbonization, around kind of technologies that are less popular, stuff like advanced nuclear, carbon capture, carbon removal. You can still find really high impact uh, funding opportunities. And I think it's important to rem remember the argument for like high impact climate charities has never been that climate is a neglected space, but rather that there are a lot of resources in climate overall and that their allocation can be improved for advocacy so that there's leverage there. So it would be too simplistic to just think about the global top level neglectedness of climate to think about the effectiveness of climate charities. I think that's a really wise and um, well thought out answer. Thank you. And yes, we will try and provide a link to that new um, report on climate change philanthropy that just recently came out. Moving right along to our next question. Uh, this is a bit of a broader question, so I might ask you all to answer it. Is there an emerging cause that you believe that we should be considering as part of our giving portfolio? So very happy to take your individual opinions on this one. I feel like I'd like to give the sort of like a give well answer and then also a Taylor answer. Um, so <laughs> give well uh, is pretty excited about some new causes as the um, as the video that played beforehand mentioned. Uh, one of the areas we're looking into right now is malnutrition. Uh, which we expect could have a lot of room for really cost-effective uh, giving. And we're trying to identify opportunities there. We've made a couple of preliminary grants, uh, which I'm happy to talk about later, to organizations working in that space. Um, and there are a couple other ones that are in our pipeline uh, right now. One of them is called uh, Intermittent Preventative Treatment for Infants. It's a, uh, it's a malaria intervention that um, has been shown to be uh, pretty very effective and cost-effective in uh, in trials, but there are very few, uh, approximately no organizations um, implementing it right now. Um, and there are like sort of complicated reasons for that, we think, but we think that with like uh, an influx of initial funding to encourage people to set up this type of program, uh, it could be really cost effective. So that's those are some of the things that are coming down, maybe the GiveWell pipeline. Um, and GiveWell's, one of our really big goals over the next few years is to find new causes, new areas uh, for people to to give to beyond our existing recommended charities. Um, I think I'll really quickly give a Taylor answer because I want everyone else to get to speak too. Um, I think there's been a lot of really interesting discussion in the EA space recently about the role of small donors, given the uh, amount of funding coming in from really large funders. Uh, and there was a post on the Effective Altruism Forum recently that I think like summarized this very well um, that you all can uh, go uh, look at at your leisure. Um, but I think that's something that is worth thinking about is being willing to give to, uh, again, as was mentioned in the video that played earlier, early stage uh, things that you have a reason to think could be potentially very impactful. So um, I, think, I think there's a lot of room for small donors to identify things that their specific sort of intuitions and worldview suggest could be really beneficial that maybe other people are going to miss um, and that are maybe like small and weird enough that they're at an early stage where a small donor could make a really big difference to that. I think that's a really valuable thing for way for small donors to be thinking um, beyond 
uh, you know, just giving to things that have been like thoroughly vetted by the EA organizations or something. Um, I think there's room for both, but I think the latter is uh, really interesting and important. I think there are a bunch, but I, I definitely, of course, I'm very sympathetic to the small opportunities. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that as donors get proportionally larger, they do look for proportionally larger organizations. Uh, you know, GiveWell does fantastic evaluations. They're not going to spend a ton of time evaluating an org that can only handle $100,000. Um, that's just not something they have capacity to do. And that totally makes sense when they're trying to figure out how to direct, you know, $50 million a year to an org. But it does mean there can be this unique opportunity for early stage orgs, smaller orgs. Yeah, certainly if something's very weird or falls a little bit outside of the scope. The other thing I was going to add that I know GiveWell will reach research a little bit uh, in time is uh, policy orgs as well. So these can be very tricky to kind of get out an exact impact of. But if you're looking for something that could be very, very strong, it might be kind of like the standard portfolio of orgs that you donate to. Uh, policy focused on, on health policy or something like that uh, could be fantastically impactful. So our main focus this year actually is researching health policy orgs. And it's because some of our previous health policy orgs have been like, fantastically effective in tiny scale. So we'll see whether that actually replicates in, in other organizations and across other issues. But uh, so far, so good. Uh, but actually, why I first unmuted my mic was because I was going to suggest that Michael seems like an obvious person who has an, an opinion on this one. So maybe I'll hand it to him next. Uh, yeah, I don't think I can, I can kind of resist the opportunity to pick up on, on what Taylor said. So um, you can split the sort of the EA world three bits. We're talking about helping the long term, talking about helping animals, we're talking about helping people now. And I work on the helping people now bit. And two things stand out as kind of opportunities for us to, to do even more good. So uh, I think the first thing is we're not really measuring what matters we should be. So Luke started with happiness. I think we should be measuring happiness. I think if we do that, we start to find some different things appear. So one area that the research uh, we've recently done at the Happy Lives Institute has pulled out is that, um, is that yeah, basically you want to be focusing on, on people's chronic, non-adaptive misery, so maybe mental health. That's what we've looked at. That, that that's going to be looks really important. Uh, pain as well, and so that's kind of one area. I think we're we're using too much guesswork. I mean, in fact, there's this whole kind of world of research um, and happiness measurement. You know, we could actually be using that instead. Vector altruism says it's committed to reason and evidence. But I think we could be we could be doing a bit better to use that. And the other thing which um, I've just been thinking about about recently is, um, uh, in a certain sense, I think like where we where we think about kind of helping people now, we're thinking much too small. Like basically, we think about physical health and poverty alleviation in low-income countries via micro-intervention, and like that's it. Like that's that's basically all we think about. So where is the grand strategy trying to work out how to take uh, take human well-being to its maximum? Okay, we're going to solve poverty. We're going to stop people dying earlier, and then what? Like there's still a gap between that and uh, and maximum well-being. And I think picking up on on, on Taylor's point, if you know if you're a small donor and you're looking for an opportunity. Fun. You can see where this is going, right? And you, you, this is just going to happen. So, if you're a small donor and you're interested in opportunities to think differently and find things that might be interesting, then uh, you know I'm I'm bought and built bought into this mad ideology of trying to to make people as happy as possible, uh, insofar as that is possible. So uh, that's the kind of work we do. You can follow me up if you're if you're interested in in trying to find out where that rabbit hole. Um, I just wanted to follow up on one of Joey's points earlier. He talked a lot about um, essentially my exact same ideas about early seed funding, but I want to expand it a little bit and talk about infrastructure. So sometimes when we talk about early funding, we're talking about staff salaries, we're talking about bringing people together and teams together, and that is like obviously incredibly important. Um, another thing that smaller donors or any donors can consider is funding infrastructure for charities, especially charities in that first five years. Um, the reason being is that a lot of us have to do things on shoestring budgets early days. Um, we have to become really creative with how we solve problems. And, you know, now Rethink Charity is in this wonderful space where we've started to build out more sophisticated systems, more sophisticated CRMs. And if we had access to that kind of capabilities earlier days, I think we would have been able to move a lot faster and do our work a lot more effectively. Of course, you know, we were dealing with funding constraints like every early charity deals with. Um, but I think now that the technology space is advancing so quickly, donors should really consider reaching out to the charities that are on their radar already and seeing if they have dream projects that might align with their interests. Because most people I talk to at charities do have a dream list. If only I had someone who would be willing to help me succeed on this project.
Yeah, I think I just want to reiterate the last point. I think that's something that we've done very strategically now in the climate space, funding small organizations, because those are the ones that are bandwidth constrained that are not able to like profit from the overall uh, funding search. At the same time, if you do scale them, it's much less risky than other times, right? Because overall, the space is very well funded. So like we are very intentionally funding stuff like infrastructure. We're funding like operations folks. We're funding fundraising folks uh, for small organizations, kind of getting them out of the vicious cycle of where they're bandwidth constrained and getting them uh, to scale faster. The kind of funding that's underprovided even in an otherwise crowded space. Yeah, I don't have too much to add because some of my favorites have already been mentioned. <laughs> um, but thing to add on that is that this is also where the role of grant making can be really uh, powerful if small donors aren't able to uh, find these opportunities themselves or they don't feel like they um, have the time to spend on that. Uh, like Johannes with the Climate Change Fund uh, helps people to do that. Also with EA funds as well, charity entrepreneurship, they have their uh, incubators, uh, incubator charities fund. So this, this can be a bridge for those smaller donors who don't, it's not really necessarily worthwhile or it would take a lot of time to find these opportunities. You can find those smaller grant makers who can help with that as well. Um, okay, so we've got a question here from Vishaka who asks, how does EA funds follow up on the outcomes and impact of previously distributed grants? And has this affected the decision-making process for future grants? So obviously this question is specifically on EA funds, but I think we might want to extend this to all of our great grant-making organisations here on the call. Unfortunately, uh, no one from EA Funds is, is here right now, except uh, Givewell do uh, actively managing in the um, Global Health and Development Fund, which Taylor can speak to. Uh, in terms of the other funds, uh, that is an area that they're, I'm, I've heard that they're wanting to pursue more, um, the kind of closing the loop on the evaluation side of things. Um, uh, it can be very hard with small grants because uh, it is... A, particular funding profile, which means it might take quite a while to see what it looks like. And you're not looking for things like everything to work out necessarily. It's kind of, you're taking a hits-based approach, which is a bit like investing in a bunch of startups and hoping that one of them will you know, become a unicorn. Um, but both uh, Taylor and uh, Johannes could probably talk to the funds that they um, are part of managing. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we are making grant decisions essentially based on expected value. So forward looking, uh, what do we expect to happen? We're also starting to, and because, I mean, also the, the space is changing really quickly. So like the policy environments are changing, et cetera. So like in, in a way, it's often hard to predict. Um, but we are doing, we're starting to do more retrospective um, work where this is possible. So uh, where we like just recently, we like registered some predictions before, what do we expect from the grants or when it's kind of easy. And then we compare or like we're going to uh, publish um, retrospective analysis of our Biden grants once both of the infrastructure bills have passed. But I think overall, there's a way where one can like over focus on this and not like reduce impact and so in a way i think one should not over over focus on it that would be my my view yeah as, as luke mentioned um the uh ea fund that uh is focused on global health and development um is is one uh input that give well uh one sort of pool of money that give well uh allocates to things other than our top recommended charities often so it's often used as part of what give well calls incubation grants um which are basically just grants that we make to things that aren't our recommended charities but that we expect will either uh, allow us to find better recommended charities or um do some sort of like evidence evaluation that will help us assess like whether something could be a, a recommended charity uh and so our the way that we follow up on that um really depends on the nature of the grant and you can go to the give well uh, page about incubation grants if you want to read more about this, but uh, I think it depends on the the types of outcomes that the allocation is supposed to be resulting in. So sometimes the grants that we make are, uh, as I mentioned, like funding evidence gathering. So in that case, the way that we would like follow up is like talking to the organization that's doing the uh, the trial or whatever and making sure that they're like able to gather the research that they intended um, and ultimately like getting the results and like looking at their analysis. Uh, other times it's to an organization to try to go out and implement some sort of pilot version of a program. Uh, and so the, the ways that we follow up there would be to monitor the effects of the program and, and, and see if they match sort of what we expected. Um, 
And we do something similar to what Johannes mentioned, which is that we'll make predictions ahead of time about what we think is going to happen um, and sort of log uh, how we're going to evaluate whether or not this thing came to pass and to what to what degree our, our expectations were met or not. Um, but it, it's, it's very case by case, just because uh, all of the projects are fair, fairly different from each other. Just to add on to that, so uh, we've got funding from uh, all the funds, or three out of four of the funds, uh, not the long-term, just one. Uh, and the kind of follow-up uh, levels is really, really different based on fund. So it actually depends a lot on the funds area. So uh, something like the poverty one that's run by Givewell, the follow-up is uh, pretty intense, I would describe it as. That will take to the other ones. You know, uh, multi-page write-ups, multiple calls, lots of modeling, uh, this sort of stuff. And that tends to be for larger uh, scale grants. Uh, if it's something like the infrastructure fund, which is more about the meta stuff, uh, that tends to be a lot lighter. Um, so that would be like a, a one-page write-up on outcomes or, or that sort of thing. And then animals kind of falls somewhere in the middle. So it really depends on the, the cause area. And I wouldn't say the funds are precedent setting the cause area so much as the funds are corresponding with norms uh, in that cause area. So typically the poverty cause area tends to be very deep, very detailed, there tends to be lots of stuff on that. Other cause areas can be a little bit less that way, either because of lack of available evidence or more limited funding or these sort of uh, kind of reasons. But yeah, so not only does it vary opportunity opportunity, but varies cause area to cause area, but uh, definitely with poverty being uh, on the higher side of the, the rigor where it kind of moves down as you get into the more speculative uh, sides of things. That's a really useful insight to be able to share. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> now we've got a question from Joe. He says, hi, Joe Galay from Denver. How can we motivate the relatively wealthy average individual to donate a percentage of their income when they feel that the impact that they can have is small compared to donations from extremely wealthy corporations or governments? Um, this is the mindset I frequently hear when discussing effective altruism with others and something that I occasionally battle feeling myself. Well, I think he's not alone. Um, Luke, you've got your hand up. <laughs> I just want to start with, uh, I totally understand that feeling. It's not a comparison game. Like, like to think about it uh, as we're all doing our personal best to um, to be part of an active participant in creating the world that we want to see. And uh, as an individual smaller donor, um, what you give uh, may not change the entire world, but it does make a world of difference to those lives that it does affect. Um, and that is something to never lose sight of and is like a really important thing that for me personally has been incredibly motivating uh because just because i can't you know um change lives for thousands or hundreds of thousands of people um if i could save a couple of lives uh or improve lives for you know hundreds of people or animals over the course of my lifetime like I, that's a life well lived in my books um i run into this quite often as well in my personal life and um, I often try to talk to people about their goals. Uh, I try to understand. I, I feel like the most important thing is for people not to feel as if they are being sold an idea and instead trying to come to an understanding with them of what are your goals? So I ask people questions like, well, what do you care about? And, and use that as a launching point to get into thinking about the problems that they are already well aligned with. I also find it really helpful to show people who are maybe rational aligned uh, numbers and math, because that is a language that a lot of people can understand. Um, I'm able to sit with some people and say, you know, 80% of our donors give less than $1,000 a year. Um, but that total actually adds up to more than our operating budget. You know, we have a lot of these donors and they are able to do a lot of good as a collective because there are so many of them and they're committed and they're staying. So also as, a, as an aside to that, a lot of these donors drive change in our organization. You know, these are the people who will take the time to let me know that my donation form isn't perfect or um, things that can really improve the experience for other people down the line. Um, there's a lot of knock-on effects for giving. And I think that once people realize how much impact they can have, not only to these smaller organizations, not only with large gifts, um, that really connects with some people. So I, I wanted to follow up on, on an idea that Luke mentioned, which uh, I also find like very personally helpful. Um, uh, th this, uh, this feeling of like comparing the amount of good that you can do to the amount of resources that are available to governments or corporations and things like that, I think is like a very natural mindset to fall into. I think that in a lot of areas of life, 
um, the idea of something like just being a drop in the bucket um, is, a, is a meaningful idea because for many things, there are diminishing marginal returns on like the next bit of that. Um, like a literal drop in a bucket, like doesn't make very much of a difference to the weight or the volume or something like that. I think that doing good is un unusual to our minds in that there are not diminishing marginal returns on uh, in the sense that like, if, if someone has the resources to donate and save a hundred lives and you have the resources to donate and save one, that 101st life is just as valuable as every hundred before it, right? Like your impact is not made less by the fact that someone else is having, uh, or, or some organization or something is having a very large impact elsewhere. For the person or people that you help, it, it means everything. Um, and I think this is often a, a, a sort of, counterintuitive way to think about things. But um, I think that comparison really doesn't matter in this space. I think that like trying to figure out the most good that you can do um, and feeling really good about being able to do whatever you can is a totally legitimate move in this space. Um, and I try to think about that and I hope that's helpful to other people too. There are actually views in philosophy where the more good being done, the less valuable the additional unit of good is, but that's kind of, that's kind of <laughs> by the by. Um, the thing that I, I take inspiration from is my my favorite Australian, uh, which is that you should do the most good you can do. I think the thing to emphasize there is is you, um, and like that's really the kind of the, the, the race you race with yourself, what maximum impact I can have. You can't be anyone else, um, so that's what you should do. But I think it, so. That's kind of on the one side, and the other side is the um, you know as the kind of rate of, uh, of of tech and crypto billionaires coming into EA increases. Then uh, the uh, donate sort of the, like small donations are going to be less valuable relative to other things, and so I think it is it, it is worth people considering. Well, okay, that like here's the amount of I can do with my donation, but like could I change my career? Is there something else I could have that I could do? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But I think that's worth um, I think that's worth reflecting on. Um, but still, it's going to be it's going to be the case that donating your money to some of the most impactful things is going to be amongst the very most valuable things you can do. And then the question is, as more money flows in, is there something even better? Uh, again, I think that's, that's something we should be, uh, we should be live to. It's worth reading that uh, blog post that Ben Todd uh, wrote on the EA forum as well. There are many ways in which small donors can outperform like per dollar, uh, a large uh, donor, um, even if they're not outperforming entirely. Also, many small donors, if you're giving effectively, you're outperforming people who are donating extraordinary amounts and, and not even doing less good, but possibly even doing harm. There are plenty of people who give a lot to charity who uh, that or give a lot to not-for-profits that are advocating for terrible things in the world. But also, finally, uh, there is this... Uh, as uh, Siobhan touched on some of this, is, is the advocacy potential for small donors is very high as well. Like you as an individual donor, uh, not only can you be giving, but you're talking about it with other people, um, being part of it. Like, and who knows the next person you talk to, like for each of the now billionaires that we have in this movement, um, there was a conversation that someone had in their life or a publication that someone did that influenced their thinking. Um, and so uh, being part of a community and viewing that lens of what are we doing together through all of the resources which are applying to these problems, I think that's a really um, st strong lens to have. And it's very much personally. Great, excellent. Yeah, I, I highly recommend that uh, that post that Luke was talking about. I think it makes a really, um, it really makes a big impact. And I think everything we've talked about today, I think that might be a, a good time for us to wrap up. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get to all of the questions today, but if you are seeking any particular answers, um, I'm sure that you could follow up with either us or the people on the panel via wherever they're available publicly. And I will just share my screen so that I can say thank you to you all for attending. So we are really happy that you've all joined us for Effective Giving Day 2021. This has been a big collaborative event from a bunch of organizations around the world. Um, and it means a lot to us that you've taken time out of your day to learn a little bit more about effective giving. Um, thank you to everyone who has been on our panel. It was a really insightful um, and inspiring talk. I know 
basically every time I hear anyone talk about the power of effective giving and all of the amazing work that each of your organisations are doing, it really reaffirms um, that I feel like I'm in the right place and that, that the effective altruism community is really doing so much good for the world. So for our attendees, uh, we'd love you to fill out our post-event survey. Uh, we, I'm hoping that Luke will pop that in the chat. Oh uh, yes, he has. Um, if you open that up and fill out our survey, we will provide you the links to everything that we have mentioned today. You can download our new, brand new giving guide, which we promote in the video, um, as well as you can opt to receive a free book on effective altruism. So please fill that out. We'd love to know what you thought of this event. Um, and mostly thank you all so much for being here and taking the time to learn a little bit more about uh, effective giving.